Well, you know, Chris Farfoy used to be a minister, minister of broadcasting, actually, Chris Farfoy, former reporter, former telly reporter in the, in the gallery, and he did something that very few people do. He crossed over from being a reporter to being a politician and rose to be a Labor cabinet minister. Not bad going, and he's a nice guy, Farfs, as he is affectionately known, um, known as. But he resigned. He said it was all too much. And he got out of politics. But now he's saying he's getting back into politics. He's going to set up shop with some mates as a lobbyist. And what is a lobbyist? Well, a lobbyist is someone who sells contacts, who greases the wheels of particularly political power within what is known as the Beltway in Wellington. It's a pretty tough old game being a lobbyist. Um, and if the government changes, all your clients can leave you because you tend to be one sort of lobbyist. You're a lefty lobbyist or a righty lobbyist. Life's been pretty good for the lefty lobbyists. A lot of them are former employees of Jacinda Ardern, um, like this guy Neil Jones, Clint Smith. Um, Tori Farnow did it for a while, the mayor of Wellington. Uh, she clipped the ticket actually with them, uh, with those former Labor people. So it's nice work if you can get it. You get paid handsomely for introducing your often commercial clients to cabinet ministers and having the odd dinner with them or getting a paper to them and basically getting your clients engaged in the business of government. Some say it's a pretty corrupt business. Uh, some say it is the um, hawking and the trading of grace and favour. And in some other countries, some other democracies, there are limitations as to how involved in that industry or that sector former politicians can be. To discuss Chris Farfoy's, and to be honest, I'm just going to say personally, I think he's left his run a little late because the government's going to change and he'll have no political capital as a lobbyist. Here to discuss his career choice is Simeon Brown, who's National's Public Service Spokesperson. Simeon, welcome back to the platform. Nice to have you with us. Oh, it's always good to be with you, Sean, and I'm glad to hear that the uh, the old Rona isn't too bad for you, but wishing you a speedy recovery. No, no, I, th I think I'm going to survive, um, which will disappoint oh, that's some people. That's good, I'm pleased. <laughs> now, that's finally hunted you down. Chris Farfoy becoming a lobbyist. Is there anything prima facie wrong with his career choice? He's a private citizen. Yeah, He's not on the taxpayers' dime. Surely he can do what he wants. Look, I mean, absolutely. I mean, this is, uh, you know, Chris Farfoy. He's, as you said, he's got a distinguished career. Um, he's um, done a lot of interesting things. Um, and I don't begrudge him, um, you know, leaving Parliament, uh, wanting to find a different line of work and obviously feed his family. Um, but uh, the issue here is around whether there needs to be a bit of time between being a cabinet minister and then coming back and doing the lobbying business. And um, the reality is, you know, our position is that actually there does need to be some time between. And the reason for that is because he has, you know, he was only three months ago receiving cabinet papers. Um, he was uh, around the cabinet table talking about these issues with his colleagues. Um, he had access to significant amount of information through the public service. Uh, and actually he now has a, um, I think a, a, a conflict in, in some ways in, re, in regards to now his role coming back and effectively using that information to effectively sell it to uh, clients who are prepared to pay. So and you're suggesting an effect, Simi, in a restraint of trade clause on former politicians? Yes. Well, I mean, the reality is if you work for, you know, uh, a lot of companies, you will have a restraint of trade clause if you're at the top of a you know, a, a large corporate company, you'll have a restraint of trade clause for a number of months or potentially a little bit longer when you leave that company in terms of being able to go and work in the same industry. And so what we're suggesting here is there needs to be something similar to that. Um, the Australians have, I think, 18 months is between when you've been a minister to when you can start lobbying if that's what you choose to do. Uh, and I think that's probably a fair amount of time. I think the Canadians go out to five years, which I think may be a little bit too long. Um, but the reality is there needs to be some period of time between when you've had access to that information, your colleagues and all of those other things, uh, which I think, are, you know, there is a public interest in that information and actually it needs to be protected. 
uh, to being able to then actually effectively commercialise that, uh, commercialise your, con- your contacts and um, and the information that you may have. Yeah. Given that, to my knowledge, this has never really happened before. Yeah. And that it seems unlikely to happen in the future. Do we really need to go to all the kerfuffle of changing the rules? Why not just let this slide with FAFs? Well, I think that's, I mean, it's about the principle here, Sean, in terms of, um, you know, as I said, I don't begrudge uh, Chris Farfoy in the slightest. I mean, the reality is it's, he's, he's left politics and he's wanting to choose to do something different. Um, but the point is, um, this could happen again. Uh, and the reality is, um, just next year, we may have. Um, a lot of ex-ministers who are looking for work, and if they can't get a job as a plain language officer, um, well, we, we might repeal that legislation too, so they won't be able to do that. Uh, they may have mm. to look at lobbying as an opportunity to to put some to pay the bills. And what we're saying is actually that you know when when that happens, it's actually probably a good idea that they can't commercialise all of those that information um, because that information they had when they were ministers of the crown, exercising their public duty swearing an oath um, and, 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 and acting under oath and actually the public have a very, um, I think, a high degree of wanting to actually protect the, the, the real uh, the public service the, the, and, the, and the role that is actually played there. So we're saying actually let's have a, let's have a, 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 a time period. We haven't determined exactly what that should be, but it should yeah. be some length of time between those two things happening. Yeah. Yeah. Um. All right. Uh, look, above, as we've got you, I also want to ask, of course, you, you called for and, and there was an inquiry underway by the Public Service Commission into the some contracts involving Nanaya Mahuta's husband, William Gannon Ormsby, and his uh, company, Ka Awatea Holdings. Have you had any progress reports from the Commissioner on that? No, we haven't at this stage. We understand he wants to complete it by the end of the year, uh, but we haven't had any progress reports on, on where that is at uh, at this stage. <laughs> Um, yeah, but look, um, you know, we will continue to uh, follow up on that particular issue because I'm not big concern to many New Zealanders, in particular your listeners here on on the platform. Yeah, all right. Look, uh, okay, back to Chris Far. Have you talked to Chris Far for you about this? No, no. Or is he just the target? Mm. Well, no, and um, it's not, and to, to do to, it's, he's not a target at all. The reality is, this is about the principle. I mean, I, I like Chris. I think most people around Parliament like Chris and get on well with Chris Farfoy. Um, I think it's about the principle of of what's happened here. Um, and the reality is, um, you know, it, 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 it might not happen often, but it could happen again in the future. And we need to ensure that we are protecting the, the you know, the information that is given to ministers. Um, in their role that they are sworn by oath to, to exercise uh, as ministers mm. of the crown, and actually um, that's something with a significant public interest, and we need to protect the public service from being politicised in that way. Mm. Look, uh, okay, let's look. Let's broaden this discussion out then, Simeon, to the whole idea of lobbying and lobbying firms. It's you could drive a truck through the rules around this, right, compared with other countries. Um, and essentially what you have, and I, I was just mentioning Tory Farnow, the new mayor of Wellington, who went from being in James Shaw's office to working alongside Neil Jones and I think Clint Brown, and they basically sell access to ministers, right? And it's never clear to me whether or not these firms, which are clearly set up with the acquiescence of political parties and politicians, and they obviously make money from selling that access, right? It's like getting to sleep in the, I don't know, in the Roosevelt bedroom or whatever in the White House, you know. Uh, it's never clear where part of the deal is that they then flick some money by way of donation to the political party concerned. We've actually got a pretty loose set of rules around political lobbying, haven't we? Well, I guess the question you're, you're suggesting there is whether there needs to be some form of, I guess, regulatory regime in place to sort of register lobbyists or have, um, you know, more restrictions around potentially staff members who work in the Well, you don't let, see, it's interesting. We do not let journalists, we don't let journalists, the issue is quite, don't don't let the journalists issue into Parliament without having them accredited to the press gallery. Yeah, yeah, look, no, I understand. There is actually already, there is, I mean, in terms of access to Parliament, Parliament as a institution already has access limitations and you have to, if you want to have um, wider access, you do have to register um, to be able to just walk in. 
Um, but, you know, there's generally open access to Parliament, but there is a, a second, well, there's a sort of a, another tier of people who, um, well, a lot of them are lobbyists, uh, and that is a public list, which I think Parliament produces every year, um, mm. uh, over and above just being able to walk in and have a meeting with somebody and, and requesting a meeting. Mm. But the reality is, we, we in New Zealand do have relatively open access to our politicians, and I think it's a good thing. Um, mm. Do we, If we go down the regulatory regime, do we end up actually professionalising it even more um, and actually uh, making it more of a um, professional sport rather than where it kind of sits at the moment. So I guess from my perspective, I don't see the case for wide-scale change. And in the, in the issue of, of, of donations that you raise, I mean, we've got very you know, stringent rules around donations <laughs> in New Zealand. <laughs> no, we haven't. You've got rules you could drive a and, truck through. I mean, don't well, the, the, well the, rules are, the rules are, there are rules, and there are rules around donation caps and donation amounts that you can give, and that the Electoral Commission already regulates that. Um, so I think what, from what I'm saying is I don't see there's a case for change at the moment. Um, mm. And I guess there's also potential risk and downside if you do professionalise it even more. So that's just uh, okay. something you have to be um, careful and considerate about. Okay. Well, Chris Farfoy's in business now. Um, you're not going to be able to introduce any legislative change for ages. It's not going to be respect. So he's still got a job, right? Yeah. And as I said, look, this is, this is not – I mean, I don't begrudge him – in terms of wanting to find work and, and do something which he enjoys. The point is about the principle, and this hasn't happened before in, in New Zealand, and it's, I think a lot of New Zealanders are, are quite shocked with what's happened uh, and, and, and sort of rightly asking the question, how can this happen? So when you look around, get comparative jurisdictions, and they don't allow this type of behaviour, and so there's something which needs to be addressed here. Yeah. Hey, Simeon, I thank you very much indeed for your uh, time this morning and for joining us uh, on the platform. We will talk. You're welcome. Thank you, Sean, and uh, take care. Cheers. That is uh, National Public Service spokesperson uh, Simeon Brown, MP. Ah, Bit of regulation. What's wrong with that? Oh, I don't know. I don't know, but Fafs is still going to have his job. That's good. He's still going to be able to glad and get the odd corporate up to Parliament to have dinner at Bellamy's with the minister. I couldn't think of anything worse.